Okay, and so let me um, share the screen. Let's see, oh, it's screen three, right. Okay, so can you see the screen and my hand waving? Yeah, we yes, can sir. see it. Yes. Okay. All right. So, so the so there'll be some questions about there'll be some so some of the first stuff will be about uh, just taking a truth table and plotting it. So, here's an example of a truth table, and it may or may not be the case that that figure two will be the same as figure one. So make sure you make sure you verify that that it is if it is, or that you verify that it is not if it is not, and um, so the whole idea is um, then here we'll have a couple of questions about the truth table itself. So, so somebody tell me what are what's what's what are the dependent variables and what are the independent variables here? The dependent variable would be s, right? That's right. And a, b, c, and d would be the independent ones. That's right. All right, and then what do we? What's the business with the x down here? What is don't that? Cares. Yeah, they are don't cares. And when we have a don't care, what does that actually mean? We could use one. zero or one. They can be zero or one. Uh, we can choose them to be zero or one. But but why why can we choose them? And what what's the point of that? The circuit will never achieve those that combination of inputs so we can do whatever we want. That's right. We're guaranteed the circuit will never have that set of inputs so we can do whatever we want. Although there's usually an exception to that unless we build some extra circuitry and that is that it could easily power up in that condition. So we do have to verify what that would what that implication might be. But other than that, yes, that's right. We're we're basically guaranteed that uh that that the circuit won't have uh, those will never have those inputs. Okay, um, good. And uh, and so when we have four variables, how many rows do we, you know, so let's say we have n variables, how many rows will we have? Two to the n. That's right. We'll always have two to the n rows. Now some of them may be don't cares, but. There, there will be two to the n combinations of the input variables then if we have n input variables. Okay, let's look at this figure. So, so we look at this figure and so the first thing we'd wanna do is, is um, if we're trying to simplify our, our problem, our truth table, we, we, we can certainly look at it in terms of the min terms and the max terms. So if we do the ones, we can choose the don't cares to be one. So we should include, we should think about them. So as you look at this, how many, how many, how many, uh, how many groups do you see? In each group, we'll call a prime. You know, let's. How many prime implicants do you see? Four. Did somebody have a question? Um, I'm saying, are there four? Yeah. So yeah, let's look at that. So. There's a group of four here. There's a group of four. Uh, maybe I've got a better one. Oh, there's, there's a group of four here. And um, there's, uh, there's a group of four here. And there's a group of four here. So let's see. So that's one, two, three, four. Yeah, there are four prime implicants. And of those four prime implicants, how many of them uh, are uh, don't cares? I mean, sorry, are how many of them are non-essential? Is it one? No. Oh. It looks like all of them are essential. All of them are essential. Yep. This this one is only covered by this group. Uh, this one is only covered by this group. This one is only covered by this group. 
this one is only covered by this group. There are none that are, there are no ones that are covered by more than, there, there are no ones that have multiple, um, no, that's the wrong way to put it. There, there are plenty of ones that have multiple groups cover them, but there aren't any ones that are, uh, but all ones are covered. Uh, no, that's not the right way to say it. Let's see. So when, what, when we're looking for an, a non-essential, all the ones within that group are covered by other groups. And we don't have any of those conditions. All, all groups have at least one one in them that is not covered by any other group. So that makes them, that makes them non essential. Okay, does that make sense? So let's, let's, so what is the, what is the solution for this one? Any, any thoughts? So what's the solution for this one? Let's do it in SOP form. Well, so let's do it. So basically we need all four of our groups. All four groups include four boxes. So all of them will have dropped two terms. It's a four variable map. So we should have, we should have four two term, uh, two variable terms to make up our answer. So we can just do them in any order, but let's take this one first. So that the middle two columns are B and the bottom and top rows would be D prime. So this would be B D prime. So we can put down uh, B D prime plus, let's do this row here. So that would be A prime B. So that's A prime B. And then uh, this group of two here, would be a prime d prime and then finally this group of uh, four there would be a prime c so we have bd prime a prime b a prime d prime and a prime c okay so let's take let's take a problem here um so there are a lot of different ones. Maybe I'll do a, maybe I'll do one off of uh, this. So in, in all the cases, um, let's see. Okay. Uh, okay. Maybe I'll, oh, I see that one, that one. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So let's do another one. Let's do. Um, Yeah, I did that one, but let me do that one. I know we got my hand done. Yeah, okay. So let's do this one. So we have we have BD plus AC plus BD, BCD, okay? So we wanna change this from SOP form to POS form. Now, the first thing we should do is we should look to apply rules nine, 10, and 11. Nine is where we combine terms. 10 is where we uh, delete a term. And 11 is where we get rid of a literal um, or eliminate a term. Okay, so do you see any, can we combine any terms here? And no, it doesn't look like it. Can we, uh, can we eliminate a term? Yes. All right, which one? The C and BCD. Yeah, because we have a BD here and a BCD here, this term can be eliminated using uh, theorem 10. All right, so now we're going to take, and th theorem 10 is x plus xy equals x. 
All right, so now we're just gonna, now we just have BD plus AC. So the simple way to do that is let BD be X and A be Y and C be Z and apply that second, second distributive law. And we're gonna apply it in the, in the direction of X plus Y Z equals X plus Y quantity times X plus Z. I ran out of room over there, but you get the idea. Uh, okay, so then, so then that's going to equal BD plus A quantity times BD plus C. And then we're going to do the same again. We'll apply it tw twice. We'll let A be X and BD be YZ. We'll let C be X and BD be YZ. And that'll give us A plus B times a plus D times C plus B times C plus D. And that's our POS solution. So we went from two terms to four terms in that case. Sometimes you wind up with more terms, sometimes you don't. And then let's look at this one. Same thing. The first thing we'll do, we'll, we'll, look, we'll see if we can apply rules 9, 10, or 11. So we have A plus B plus C, A prime plus B plus C. B prime plus C plus D. Do you see any, any, can we apply, can we combine terms? Can we eliminate a term? Can we eliminate a literal? So what do you think? We have an A, B, C here and an A prime, B, C there. So we can combine those to B, C because the A can drop. And then we're B, C plus, or sorry, B plus C rather times uh, B prime plus C plus D. All right, now we have uh, now we have a B plus C and a uh, B prime plus C plus D. So we could let we could use the multiplying and factoring. We could let we could hook up B with that and B prime with this, and that would give us. That would give us B times C plus D plus B prime C. And then we can distribute the B in here and we can get BC plus BD plus B prime C. And then we can combine these two and get C plus BD. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so so there'll be there'll be probably two of these, and they they won't be super difficult. All right, um, all right. So let's look at uh, one that we've done a bunch of times. Let me see if I have another blank one. Make gone through these a number of times here. Let's see, maybe I'll just point one out. Okay, I will I'll do this one. So here we have um, a sequence detector where we have an input X and an output Z, and the network outputs is Z equals zero unless it sees the sequence one, one, zero, or zero, one, zero where z equals one. And the network resets as soon as the target can't be realized, discarding the value just received. If the target's realized, it also resets so the next value starts the next possible target. Okay, so, um, so, uh, so it's a more, so since it's a more, our output will be associated with With the nodes, you know, DES, and not the links. Okay, so we start in S0. If we look at our sequence, it's 110 and 010. So our last two items are the same in both sequences. So our first item is one and zero. So it turns out we get our first one in, no matter whether we get a one or a zero, uh, we have the first possible item in our three item target because of. The first item doesn't matter. So we 
we put a zero or a one here, and that takes us to S1. And then in S1, if we get a one, we can go to S2. And if we get a zero in S2, we can go to S3, and we can output we can output z equals one. So I'll just write a z there. All right. Now, if if on the other hand, in S1 we get a we don't get a one, we get a zero, then we have to reset. We go back to S0. If on the other hand, from S2, we get a one instead of a zero, then we have to go up here. And now from S3, what do we do? So we, we have z equals one here. Everywhere else, there's no z, so it's z equals zero. Our next value, just like in our S0 node, could be the first item in the next sequence. So we'll go to here on a one or a zero. OK? Does that make sense? All right. Now let's. Uh, Let's look at, oh, let's see. Um, I think we've been over this. Let me, let me that one here. Yeah, okay, perfect. So let's say we have um, an SM chart like this, and we already have defined. So we have, so first off, how many, how many, uh, how many blocks do you see on this? Uh, how many blocks are there in this SM chart? Three. That's right. Three. And you always know that because every block has to have a state box. Doesn't have to have anything else, but it has to have a state box. All right. And then in in and so uh, so let's look. So we haven't really even given the problem, but so let's. So the other thing is we've we've gone ahead and assigned. So there are three blocks. So how many flip flops do we need at a minimum in order to cover three states? We need two, two flip flops. That's right, two. We could do up to four states with two. And so we've gone ahead and assigned them. This is zero, zero. So that's really A prime, B prime. Zero, one is A prime, B. And here we did one, one or A, B. So, and that does leave A, B prime as a don't care, but we're not gonna worry about that at the moment. Okay, you, and you don't even have to consider that. The, you don't have to worry about don't cares. You, you can worry about them. It's really straightforward, but I'm, I'm, not, gonna, I'm not gonna test you on that. Okay, so so now we have we have more outputs. We have a ZA more output associated with node S0. We have a ZB more, more output associated with S1. And the other more output is ZC associated with S2. And then we have two melee outputs, Z1 and Z2. And they both show up in, in, node, uh, in node S2, depending on X. If X is zero, if we're in this state, and x is zero. The next, the new in it, the new x is zero. Then we output s one. I mean z one. And if the new x is one, we output z two. All right. So, so let's see if we can. So let's see if we can solve for the, for the da. We'll solve for the d sub a input. Well, remember how we do that. We take every every path. Uh, we take every path that has um, a or every node that has a one in it for A. So if, if in this case, uh, we only have, we have, well, we have a lot of nodes, but uh, we, we have three nodes, but which nodes have a one for A? Looks like node three. Actually, yeah, S2. S2, sorry. That's right. Well, the, the code for is three, but S2. That's right. So in S in node S2, uh, we have to account for every pass into S2, which is where the only node where our A is a one, and that will give us then the formula for A. So what are the paths into S2? We 
Well, one comes from S1 when X is one. So that would be, we're in S1 when A prime, when we have A prime B, and then if X is a one, then that is the path in. So that would be A prime B X. So one of the paths is A prime B X. I'm sorry, there's no B prime there. A prime BX, and then the other path comes from S2. It, remember, you can't you can't have a re-entry within the block. You have to go out of the block and back in. Didn't really draw the block, but it would be something like this. All right, so we go out of the block here and we come back in. So that would be S2 is AB, and we take this path when X equals one. So that would be plus ABX, and that just gives us BX. Now, what about for the D, B input? Now we need all the paths where, where, the, uh, where, where the value in is, is, is one for B. And so B is a zero here, B is a one there, and B is a one there. So we have to count for all the paths again into S2, but we've already done that, that's BX. And then we have to count for all the paths into uh, S1. How many paths do you see into S1? Only one. That's right. So we only have to count for one. It comes from S0. And so that's A prime B prime. And it's when X equals one. So that's A prime B prime X. So, uh, so all we have to do then is, uh, is write uh, A prime B prime X. And we can't really combine it with anything. Up. Well, no, that's not true. We could combine these two. So really we can simplify this to a prime X. So it's plus BX. So that actually is a prime X plus BX. If we'd written this all out, it would have been obvious, but anyway. Uh, and if you don't simplify it, that you probably wouldn't burn you. Um, okay, now the rest of the stuff on here is really easy. Our ZA output is just whenever we're in node S0, that's A prime B prime. So ZA just equals A prime B prime. ZB just equals, now if, if ZA, let's say we had ZA down here as well, then you'd have to have A prime B prime plus AB. But it's only appears here, so it's just A prime B prime. Here we have ZB only appears here, so it's A prime B. And ZC only appears here, so it's AB. Now, the conditional output Z1 only happens if you're in S2 and you get an X equals zero as your next input. So that would be A, B, X prime. And Z2 would be A, B, X, because X equals one when you have get Z2. And that's all there is to it. Now, if you had another point up here where you had say Z1 here as well, then you'd have to add that path in for Z1. All right, questions about that? For the inputs on that circuit, is it just uh, three? So how so how so as you look at this, uh, how many inputs does the circuit have, and how many outputs does it have? One of each. Okay, so it actually has one input and five outputs. So if you looked at the state table, uh, you only have one, one input. So the state table, we could draw the state table. Uh, yeah, let's draw the state table. So, so here would be the state table. So you'd have A and B for the, for the, for the inputs. So you'd have 0, 0, uh, 0 1, 1, 1, and uh, 1, 0, but that's a don't care. So I went ahead and put it in the same order that we would actually put it into the K-map. Uh, and then for the next state, A plus, A plus and B plus, you have uh, X equals zero, X equals, uh, and X equals one. Uh, so, uh, so, so if you're in um, if you're in uh, zero zero and uh, you get a, you get a zero, 
then where do you go? Well, if you get a zero, you go back to S zero. So you'd put in, so well, this would be S zero, S one, S two, and don't care. So you'd go back to S zero and on a one, you'd go to S one. And then if you're in S1, on a one, you go to S2 and on a zero, you go back to that. So here you go to S0, and on a one, you go to S2. And then in S2, if you get a, if you get a one, you stay there. So you go to, you go to, you stay in S2, but on a zero, you go back to S0. And then for our output, so we have an output ZA, ZB, ZC, and uh, Z1 and Z2. So Z1, well, for ZA, uh, so that's just, uh, it's just a one here. For ZB, and then it's zero everywhere else. For ZB, it's a one here. For ZC, it's a one there. And then for Z1, so it's, it's you have to divide that into X equals zero and X equals one and the same over here x equals zero and x equals one so for z1 if x equals zero then uh you would get a one here but a zero here and all zeros up here and for this one you would get zeros up here but you get a zero and a one like that so that's what the state table would look like if we did the state table does that help Because remember, these are the z's are mealy, so they depend on the x's. These are not; these are more, so they don't depend on x. So the only place where you actually get a one for z one is when x equals zero and you're in state uh, s two. And here, the only place you get a one for z two is when x is one and you're in state. Uh, S2. And here, these don't depend on x's. If you're in state S0, you get it. ZA is one, zero everywhere else. If you're in S1, ZB is one, S0 everywhere else. And if you're in state S2, then ZC is one and zero everywhere else. And that's all there is to it. Okay, does that help? All right. Okay, um, so let me go over this one. Um, let's see, I may, let me think about Yeah, maybe I'll do. Um, all right let's do um yeah so let's do let's do this one okay so we'll we'll do this non-sequential counter all right so let's say you have a three-bit counter and you're just going to count the sequence one one zero one 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 zero zero one zero one one and one zero one and then back to the beginning. All right. So in this case, uh, we could do it with an SM chart, but I've set it up here to be done with a, with a state table. Uh, and now how many inputs, how many, how many inputs does this problem have? How many outputs? I don't think it has any inputs because it's just a counter. That's right. No inputs, no outputs, except for a clock. That's it. Right. So it doesn't have an X input, doesn't have a Z output. Now, you could argue that the flip-flop states are the output, which they kind of are. But since you have to have those anyway, you don't really have any outputs. All right. So, OK. So the way we do this, we just we just go ahead and order all, all possible eight states in, in binary order so we can extract them into k-maps. And then we just make sure that for state 110, we specify next state of 111. 
When we get to 111, we specify 001. When we get to 001, we specify 011. And we get to uh, uh, 011, we specify 101. And when we get to, to 101, we specify 110. So, and that's so 6, 7, 1, 3, 5. So when we get to 6, we're going to 7. From 7, we're going to 1. From 1, we're going to 3. From 3, we're going to 5. From 5, we're going to 6. All right. So here we are in 0. It's a don't care. Here we are in 1. From 1, we're going to 3. So 0, 1, 1. 2 doesn't appear, so it's a don't care. From 3, what are we going? 5. That's right. 5. 1, 0, 1. 6, uh, f 3, five. 4 is a don't care. 5. From 5, where are we going? To 6. 1, 1, 0. And from 6, where are we going? Seven. Did somebody say 7? All right, we're going to seven. And from seven, where are we going? Back to one. That's right, zero, zero, one. So now all we have to do is fill out the K-maps and we got it made. So we have a don't care, zero, don't care, one, don't care, one, one, zero. This one is don't care, one, don't care, zero, don't care, one, one, Zero, remember to reverse the bottom two rows. Don't care, one, don't care, one, uh, don't care, zero, one, one. All right, so now all we have to do is make these work and it's gonna be a little bit messy. So we have this group of four, this group of two, that group of two. Here we have this group of four and this group of four. And here we have uh, this group of four and this row of four. And then you can just write the equations. So the equation here would just be, that's A prime plus that's uh, B, A prime B. This one is, um, this one is C prime, B prime, or B prime, C prime. This one is uh, uh, C prime, plus A prime B plus A B prime. So that's, that's the A input, that's the B input, that's the C input. How many gates would it take to implement this with our three flip-flops? So how many gates do you have for this one? One OR gate. That's right. How about here? Another OR gate. How about here? AND gate, AND gate, three input OR gate. So three mm -hmm. gates, one gate, one gate, five gates. Is it assumed that we're going to have inverted inputs and that we won't need a NOT gate for some of those? Yeah, because the... Uh, because the the flip flops always output uh, Q and Q prime. Oh right, it's a good question, but but in most situations we we do always have a B prime and C. You know we do always have a you know the variable and its prime available most of the time if they're the flip flop states. Now if they're an input, that wouldn't necessarily be the case. If in the case of X, we wouldn't necessarily have X prime available. We might we would have to have an inverter for that. But that's a good question. Gotcha, thank you. All right, let's look at this one. So here we have a, a Mealy sequential circuit. It has one input, one output. It will produce an output of one whenever four ones are input in a row and zero otherwise. And it resets as soon as a zero is received but overlapping targets are allowed. So if you get four ones and you get another one, then that would count as another group of four ones. And, uh, and it, puts, it only generates the output of one where you have four ones and it's zero otherwise. All right, so we start in S zero. Now, if loop one, where, when, we, when would we go for loop one? So first off, we have one input, right? One input. 
We'll call it X. So how many paths do we have to account for out of every node? Well, if we have N inputs, we have to do two to the N. We only have one, so two to, two to the one is two. So we have to count for two paths out of every node. Okay, so one here's one path and here's the other path. So when do we take path one? And it's mealy, so and so what would our output be? When you have a zero input. So you go here on a zero and we'd output a zero. Or you can even say, well, whatever. Okay, and then two, we go there on a one and we'd output a zero because we don't have four ones. Now we're in S1, so this would be nothing. Then this would be, we have our first one. Now we're in S1. We go to S4 if we get a one, say, and we output zero, output a zero. And so this would be two ones. And then on a one here, we go to S3, I'll put a zero, and now we have one, two, three ones. Now, what's path eight represent? If you receive another one. That's right. And what would you output? One. That's right, because that is your target. But you stay in S3 because now you've still got three, three ones. So if you get another one, you'd output a one again and stay there again. If Where would you go? So if you get a zero, you're going to go up here and output a zero. From here, if you get uh, if you get a zero, you're going to go up here and output a zero. And from here, if you get a zero, you're going to output a zero. And that accounts now for two paths out of every node. Does that make sense? So the links are labeled. So I might ask you, uh, what's what's the x value and and the output? What's the input and the output value for each of those nodes? for each for one of these paths okay all right um so let's look at this one it's the same thing as we did before so here's a here's a here's this sm chart so this is already pretty well done well let me let me print let me find where did i print them no, no. okay so here's one so here we have links drawn. So you would use a state machine chart for a problem with an input X and an output Z. Let's see, I'll do my dog is underneath my feet. No oh, baby, sorry, didn't mean to disturb you. Okay, baby, you can stay underneath here, honey bear. Come on, come on back under. Come on, baby. Yeah, that's a girl. Sorry. She didn't like me moving my feet. <laughs> oh, well, I was getting cramps though, so I didn't have any choice. All right. Okay, can you all see this okay? Yeah. Cool. All right. So, uh, so you're to use a state machine chart for a problem with an input X and an output Z where Z equals zero, except where the target 0010 is detected. Overlapping targets are allowed. So you can use that last, the last zero can be used as the first zero in the next sequence. Okay, so overlapping targets are allowed. Use a mealy machine. Z is assumed zero if conditional assignment's not in the path. So in other words, if, so here, Z equals one and everywhere else, Z equals zero. Um, okay. Uh, Note two flip flops A and B are used to hold the present state. And I've gone ahead and I've labeled, I've, I've gone ahead and this, done the flip flop state assignment for each of our four states. Well, so how many state boxes do we have? Four. That's right. Okay, we have one input X, one output Z. The only place where Z is one is here. Notice I don't, I don't have to write Z equals one, just the appearance of Z means it's one. And the disappearance of Z means it's zero. So it doesn't show up anywhere else, so it's zero everywhere else. All right, so let's, let's go through. So we start here, we have nothing. If we get a one, we still don't have the first item in our sequence, which is a zero, so we stay here. But if we get a zero, now we have it, we get a zero. And then if we get another zero, now we've got two zeros. 
And then if we get a one, now we have zero, zero, one, which is again, what our sequence is, zero, zero, one. And finally, on the last zero, we have our sequence C equals one, and then we go, we start over. All right, here, if we get a one, we stay. Here, if we get a one, we go back to S zero. Here, if we get a zero, we can stay here because we still have two zeros. It doesn't tell us that we have to reset as soon as the target can't be realized. And so we still have two zeros. We've got, in fact, three zeros, zero, zero, zero. But we can ignore that zero, and we've got our two zeros. Because we had two, we added another zero. So now we've got three zeros, but we only need two. So we can stay in S2. And then down here, uh, if we get a zero, then, then where should we go? Where do you think? So remember, we said we could have overlapping targets. So, this one. so yeah, so we, yes, because now what we really have is we have zero, zero, one, zero. Well, the one doesn't count, so none of that counts, but this does, that counts as our first zero in our next possible sequence. And so that's the path down here. And if we get a one, we have nothing, so we go back to zero. Does that make sense? Okay, so now we should be able to write all the answers. We should be able to write our DA input, our DB input, and our output Z. Now, Z is easy. It's just A, B, X prime. So we don't have to worry about that. What about DA? So we find all the paths where A is one. So what, what, what states is A one? Two and three. Two and three. All right. So we need all the paths into two. It turns out there's two paths into two. One comes from two and one comes from one. So this would be A prime B, X prime, plus A, B prime, X prime. And then we have one down here. So that, would, that comes from here. So that's A, B prime, X. It's raining good here. I don't know about you guys. Yeah, yeah. it's making the lights flicker over here. Uh oh, yeah. Well, if we lose you, we're just about done anyway. Okay, how about DB? Same thing. Everywhere the B is a one. The B is a one here. The B is a one there. So we we can take uh, the one path in here, which was A B prime X, plus then the paths in here. How many paths do we have in to S one? Two. Yep. A prime, B prime, X prime, plus uh, A, B, X prime. And can't really combine anything. Nope. So we're done. All right. So that's, that's all you have to do. And I'll ask you questions. I've labeled some of these paths. Uh, so we might ask questions about them. Okay. Um, let's see. One last problem. Let's do this one. So on this one, we have uh, we have a JK flip flop, and so we have a J and a K input, and then we got a clock and we got a clear. Now, is the clear active high or active low? Active high. High. Active high. It is active high. And how about the clock? Is it falling edge or rising edge? Falling. Falling. OK. So notice, we go through and we look at all the falling edges. Well, the first thing we do is we hatch out where the clear is active. Turns out it's one here. It's high here, so it's active there. So we hatch that out. Here, the clear is not active. Then we mark all the falling edges that are not blocked. So this falling edge, not blocked, that one not blocked, that one not blocked, this one blocked, 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 and this one not blocked. Now we just write what the J and the K are. So the J is a one and the K is a one here. J is a zero and K is a one. Here, they're both ones. And then down here, um, 
j is a zero and k is a one. All right, now, uh, we also know that everything has to be delayed five nanoseconds after the active edge, both, both of the assertion of the clear and, and also the falling edge of the clock. So, so we say that Q starts at zero. So here's Q at zero. And we know it, it can't actually change until we get five nanoseconds after the clock. And every division is five nanoseconds. So, so at the clock, J and K are both one. So what's Q gonna do five nanoseconds later? Toggle. That's right, it's gonna to toggle. So here it is. Now it can't change until the next five nanosecond delay, which would be right here. Here, uh, J is zero and K is one. So what, what happens? Now you just have to remember, remember that J sets, K clears. If they're both zero, it's a hold. And if they're both one, it's a toggle. So what happens here? Zero and one. J is zero, K is it one. It clears. Yeah, that's right, it clears. So it goes to zero, stays down, can't do anything till at least five nanoseconds after the next clock. They're both one, what's it gonna do? Toggle. Toggles again. Goes up here and oops, we, now, we have, now we have the clear asserted. But it doesn't change right there. It waits five nanoseconds and then it's gonna go down to clear to zero. And it's gonna stay there, no questions about it. Now, does it do anything at this edge right here? No. That's right. The end of the assertion of the clear doesn't do anything except turn loose the clock. But here we have J is zero and K is one. So what's gonna happen five nanoseconds after the clock? It clears. Yeah, which means it stays zero, doesn't do anything. So, so here's your answer, like that. If you do it like that, you should have no trouble. If you've got a D flip-flop, then you only have to consider the D input, and it only pertains when the clock is active. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, why don't we, uh, you know, I think, let me give you a few minutes to ask questions about something you might or might not understand. But that pretty much, I think that covers most of what's gonna be on the test. So. Dr. Paul. Yeah. So the test is gonna be 100 questions, right? You didn't change anything. Uh, the test will be, uh, it, it'll be somewhere between 80 and 100 questions, yeah. And each question would be like two points to like one point? Yeah, each question will be whatever it takes to make 100. So if it's 80, it'll be 1.2 points, I guess, or 1.25 points. Gotcha. No, Thank I guess 1.2. Yeah. I might, I might make it worth, I might make it worth 103 points 104 points, and those would be just bonus points. So your max score would be 100. So if you got 102, you know, that's just gravy. But I don't, I, I, well, somebody might get everything right. Never know. I would like to see that. Any other questions? Is there any, so, so this should give you a pretty good idea of what you need to study. Um, sir, could you clarify the rules on prime implicants and essential prime implicants on a K map? Because um, that's something I'm kind of confused on is, I guess, how many prime implicants there are. Yeah. So let's so let's talk about the uh, the definitions. Okay. Let's uh here we'll pull up. Let's pull up another. Let's pull up another example of that. So we got probably have a bunch of them. Hey, there's a person whose mic is open. Yeah, somebody's somebody's rocking us out here. 
Yeah. Okay. Mute them. Okay. Um, so, uh, so here's an example. So the first thing you have to do, well, this was back on test two. Um, so you copied from the truth table into the K-map. And then once you got done, so here are the ones you have. So let's, let's, um, let me, let me redraw that. Um, I'll redraw it. So. Okay, so. Okay, so here's what we got. Now look at this. Now tell me. So let's. So let's. Let's uh. Let's see. So how many how many prime implicants do you see there? Well, let's draw. Let's circle. So the easiest one is this group of four. Uh, we've got a group of two here, a group of two here, a group of two here, and these two are also a group of two. Now, as you look at this. Um, so how, so every one of those counts as a prime implicant. So you have one, two, three, four, five. So there's five prime implicants. How many of them are non essential How many of them are essential? Only where, which they, they, so the, de well, the definition of a prime implicant, you can't combine it with anything else to make us a, 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 to double the group. So in this case, can you combine this group of two with another group of two to make a group of four? No. No. So that's a prime implicant. Can you combine this group of four with a group of four to make a group of eight? No. Nope. Can you combine this group of two with another group of two to make a group of four? No. Nope. You could, now, are you allowed to combine this group of three? No. Only powers of two. No power, no, nothing else. So only one, two, four, eight, 16, and so forth. 32, 64, that's it. So as, as attractive as it might seem to put six boxes together, you can't do it. Or three boxes, or 10 boxes, illegal. They have to be one, two, four, eight, 16. So here's another group of two. Can you combine that group of two with another group of two to make a group of four? No. And then here's a group of two. Can you combine that group of two? Nope. So you have one, two, three, four, five prime implicants. Now, how do you tell if a prime implicant is essential? It contains at least one one not covered by any other group. Okay, so is this one covered by by more than one group? Yes. Okay, but how about this one? No. And how about this one? No. So that, one's, that, one, is, that one is essential. How about this one? Any other group cover that one? No. So that group's essential. And how about this one right here? Remove one of those groups. So, so, so that is not essential. So this group of two is not essential. And this group of two is not essential because this one can be covered by two groups. This one can be covered by two groups. This one is covered by two groups as well. So none of these ones only are by themselves and making, a, making one of the prime implicants essential. How about this one? Um, it's essential. It's, it isn't covered by any other group. Therefore, this group of two is essential. So you have one, two, three essential prime implicants, two non-essential, and your final solution has to have always, always all the essentials. So three essentials plus one of the non-essentials in this case to get this one right here. And that's the only outlier. The rest of it's all covered anyway, but you have to get that one and you've got two choices and both of them are equivalent. Now you might pick one or the other depending on other, other things like what would simplify your map better and stuff like that. But, uh, or what would, what would, uh, well, well, there it might help, like with initial conditions, for instance, 
you might power it up and see what happened. And you might say, oh, let me, let me, I was, I was using this one. Let me try this one and see if it powers up better and, and, and avoids a, a problem or, a, you know, whatever. But, but basically it's an equivalent solution. So you may not care. It may be fine. There may not be any reason to fiddle with it. Pick whichever one you want. All right. Any other questions? I had a question for number six on that uh, list of figures that you showed us. Yeah. Okay. I probably can't find it again. Uh, so what, 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 what was it? Um, it just had to do with the wording. It was at the very end. It's in, if the target is realized, it also starts the next turning value. If it were to have not have said that, if it were to have said, if the target is realized, it also resets, well then it would you, go straight back to zero, right? Yeah, right. All right. That's right. Okay. Any other questions? So just, just remember the main thing not to do is to panic and, and start. So you're, it is open book. Uh, you can, Google stuff on the internet. I don't care. That's fine. What I what you what you're not allowed to do is call up one of your buddy students and try and share and compare answers. It and that's why I you know that's why I have it randomized and you can only do one at a time and you can't back up. But uh, so you can start the test at midnight tonight, anywhere from midnight tonight till eleven fifty nine Wednesday night. Professor. If we start the test at midnight and it's still raining and our power, our power goes out, what do we do? So, yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, if your power goes out and stays, if your power goes out for a little bit and comes back on, you should be able to pick back up where you were uh, just by logging back on the Blackboard. Uh, it, if you're, there isn't any way to, pa to pause it. Um, if it goes out permanently, then, um, then send me an email, and and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll give you, a, I'll, I'll give you a password to use, and another, and I'll let you uh, try it again, like later tomorrow, or you know, I'll let you start it again, do a okay. second attempt. So that's a good question, though. But it, but I'll probably give you a good, I'll probably give you a good three hours to do it. So. I hope like heck our power didn't go out for three hours. Okay. But it's a good question. Let me ask, so how, so how has this year been for you? I, I mean, I don't know how you feel. I've hated COVID and I feel like you probably didn't get all you deserved, but, um, but I don't know. Did you feel like it was okay? Did you, do you feel like you were able to learn through, you know, online? I'm ready to get back. <clears throat> yeah. I'm ready to get back in the classroom. I can't stand it. Yeah. I, yeah. I will tell you for micro one next semester, are most of you taking micro one? Yeah, I am, sir. Yeah. So if, if you, if uh, we, we actually manufacture the, the boards that you guys have to solder on the through hole ports, but we, we actually surf it. We, we uh, stencil the boards. We, we get the, the, Printed circuit boards get made in China. That process is pretty complicated, but but with the printed circuit board, which we designed, and uh, then what we do is we uh, stencil on the solder paste and we pick and place on the parts. There's about 30 parts on the board or so, and then we uh, put them in a refill oven and bake them, and then uh, and then we test them, and then we put them in a little bag, and then you guys get the the board with all the surface mount parts plus all the loose parts you have to solder on. Uh, there's about, I think, 14 of them. And, uh, and once you get to all those soldered on, then your board is up and ready to work. Um, so if you, if you want to help me do that, uh, just send me an email, uh, just paul.morton at utsa.edu uh, sometime in the very first few days of August. And I'll, and I'll ha be happy to tell you, I'll probably send out an email to the, to the whole class. So if you're still using your old email address, you should get it. And anybody that wants to come to my house and, uh, and, and help make the boards in the garage, it takes about, takes about six students to do it. 
Um, we could even fit seven or eight or nine. So if, if you're interested in that, you're welcome to come do that. Um, so just let me know. But we'll probably do that uh, the, maybe the second week of August. Um, or maybe even, maybe, yeah, probably like sometime after the 4th or 5th of August. Um, so, yeah, so if you email me like on the, on the very end of July, the very 1st of August, then we'll hook you up. And we'll have some pizza to eat and stuff like that. To, but we'll, it take about, it'll take about three or four hours to, to, to do it. And we'll probably start maybe 5 p.m. with a little break for eating some pizza at some point. Is that for students who have already taken micro? No, you can no. In fact, it's kind of fun to do it if you never take if you haven't taken micro because then you're making you're making your board that you're going to be using. No, anybody can come. So you're more than welcome. All righty. Um, if you haven't, I don't know if the survey is still available. I know they were crying because not too many surveys were filled out. So if you haven't done the survey and it's still available, it'd be nice if you do it, but don't don't feel like you have to. But but you're welcome to do that. Um, all right. Okay, so that's good. Uh, I think you guys should do fine. Um, just remember, don't panic. Don't spend 45 minutes looking up one question on the internet trying to figure it out. If you can't get it, you can't get it. Go on. It's better that you answer all the questions than than that you would, you know, get spend, you know, a lot of time getting a few questions right that you didn't know and then leave a bunch unanswered. Because you know you're gonna you're gonna have a pretty good idea, I, you know. But I mean, you know, you'll miss some probably. But but uh, just give it your best shot. You'll be fine. Uh, you know, anybody that does all the work, you know, does the work in the class, takes all the tests, does the homework, you're not gonna flunk. Uh, you you might get a C, maybe a C minus, but that's that's as low as it'll probably be. Doctor Paul. Yeah. Would you curve the grades? Yeah, I I do curve them a little bit. What I do is if, say, the highest grade is, say, a, a 95 or 92, then I, I give everybody like eight points. And so that that kind of moves it up. So the high grades always and And even if somebody gets like a 98, I might still give everybody five points. So I, I, I boof it up a little bit. Um, and that's why I let people do corrections if they get, you know, if they get way below 70, I, I let them move their score up some. Thank so. you, sir. All righty. Be sure, be sure and take it. Remind all your classmates to take it because we probably won't have a makeup for this one uh, unless, unless there's a big power outage. Send me an email if you really have a problem. All right. Okay, I think with that, let's see. Um, oh, I think I'm still sharing my screen maybe. No, what's up? Oh yeah, that's it. Okay, all right. We will see you all then on the, uh, um, well, probably in micro eventually. All right. Thank you, sir. Good. Bye. Thank you. You should. You bet. Bye bye.